Hello my lovely lunatics. Tonight we are doing an adult bedtime stories and we are reading one of my favorite books, The Secret History of the World by Mark Booth. We are on chapter 11. If you've not already subscribed, please do that. Smash the thumbs up button if you are loving this book. Ring the notification bell so you get notified when I upload and leave me a comment. I just want to shout out one of my new subscribers. I will put our comment interaction over here. It is so dope when you guys leave comments and let me know which videos you're enjoying and then I know which videos I should make next. And it also gives me that like extra oomph to make videos more often because otherwise it's just kind of me doing it because I enjoy to do it and also I don't get paid until I get to a thousand subscribers. Another reason you should do that. And 4,000 watch hours in a year. But you guys are doing awesome with that. So if you want say in what videos go up next then leave me a comment. So get comfortable and let's get into it. Chapter 11, Getting to Grips with Matter. Imhotep in the Age of the Pyramids, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, Abraham and Melchizedek. <laughs> if I ever pronounce things like really terrible, which is probably a lot of the time, you can also comment and let me know that or just, you know, silently laugh to yourself. <laughs> but sometimes I'm just trying to not stop and acknowledge it because it, like, takes time to do that every single word. And if you guys don't know, then maybe you think I'm pronouncing it right. Or maybe I am, right? Yeah. As long as society has existed, there have been small groups within it which have practiced secret techniques to work themselves into alternative states of consciousness. Yo. I've been watching videos about this lately. They have done this in the belief that this alternative state of consciousness lends the power to perceive things inaccessible to ordinary everyday consciousness. The problem is that from the point of view of today's everyday consciousness, which is common sensual and down to earth in a quite unproceeded way, everything seen in the alternative state is almost by definition delusional. Okay, but what about like DMT with the little like, some people call them elves, but they're like interdimensional beings. You just, you can't deny things like that unless you don't understand it or have any idea what people are talking about. If initiates of secret societies work themselves into hallucinatory states in which they communicate with disembodied beings, see? <laughs> see the future and influence the course of history, then these things are just that, hallucinations. But what if they can be shown to yield results? We have begun to see how these states have inspired some of history's greatest art, literature, and music. But all of that might be dismissed by someone minded to do so as merely a matter of the life of the imagination. Something without any relevance to life's practical aspects, a lot of art, even great art, has an element of fantasy after all. Our modern mindset prefers to see more concrete results. What about great feats of engineering or great scientific discoveries? In this chapter, we will be following the course of an age when great initiates of the mystery schools led humanity to some unequaled feats of engineering. From the temple of Baalbek in Lebanon, which includes in its construction a block of carved granite weighing about a thousand tons that even today's strongest crane could not lift, to the Great Pyramid at Giza and other lesser known pyramids in China. I asked my tattoo artist for some reason if woolly mammoths could carry the bricks used to build pyramids like on their tusks, or if like six people could put a harness on a woolly mammoth and like drag it over there. And it's, it just, that's stupid. Why would you ask that? And that reminded me, actually, I wanted to show you guys my new tattoo. And I'm really sorry that I'm taking a lot of time out from the book. But, look, it actually intertwines in another way. So, I guess the eye's not really the same. This is more like a reptilian eye, and this is the eye of Ra. But, that's my new tattoo. And, there's purple on the eyelid. And, I guess I just never thought about it until i was looking at this like i know the bi pride flag is pink purple and blue right but i didn't realize until i was looking at this the reason that is is because pink is girls blue is boys and they make purple so that's both i really can't believe i was like yesterday years old when i realized that let me know what you guys think of my tattoo oh i also wanted to make a note to show you guys which i mean you can see my Jack Skellington PJs, they glow in the dark. 
if you guys care enough, then you can let me know in the comments. And then on the next Adult Bedtime Stories, I will show you. And also, my Jack and Sally socks. At the start of this age, the first great civilizations seemed suddenly to spring from nowhere. In the Sumerian civilization, dominated by the bull hero Gilgamesh, in the Egypt of the bull cult of Osiris, and in bull running Crete, the age of these civilizations is the age of Taurus. Beginning early in the 3rd millennium BC, for no very good reason, conventional history can determine vast numbers of people now began to live together in highly organized cities of extraordinary size, technical brilliance, and complexity. A shadowy but momentous event took place in China. It's always fucking China. It is shrouded in a mystery. Even great initiates are unable to see it with anything approaching total clarity. In the 3rd millennium BC, the people of China lived a tribal nomadic existence, and according to Rudolf Steiner, it was into one of their encampments that an extraordinary individual was born. Just as, thousands of years later, another exalted heavenly being would descend to earth in order to incarnate as Jesus Christ, so now Lucifer incarnated too. Oh, I thought they were going to say that there is a Chinese Jesus. Apparently not. The birth of Lucifer was the beginning of wisdom. Oh, right, like the apple knowledge, yeah. All right. Of course, I'm using wisdom as a particular sense, the same sense academic biblical scholars use when they talk about the wisdom books of the Bible. The wisdom contained, for example, in the book of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes is a collection of rules for a happy and successful life. But unlike the teachings contained in other biblical books, there's no moral or religious dimension here. You know, it's pretty useful to actually read the Bible even if you aren't of the Christian religion, just because, as this is saying, there's life advice and prophecies and shit in there. This wisdom is entirely prudential and practical, advising you what you must do to look after your own best interests. There is no suggestion, for example, that good behavior is likely to be rewarded or bad behavior punished, except by human agency. In fact, there's no notion of a providential order at all. These books compiled in the form we now have them in about 300 BC were the fruits of a way of thinking which had developed approximately two and a half thousand years earlier. The Secret History proposes that this form of wisdom became possible as a result of the incarnation and ministry of Lucifer. For the most part, initiations into spiritual disciplines take place between childhood and adulthood. And after many years of preparation, for example, initiation into the Kabbalah has traditionally only been permitted at the age of 40, and candidates for initiation into the school of Pythagoras had to live in isolation and without speaking for years before their education could begin. But from birth, Lucifer was raised entirely within the confines of a, mis of a mystery school. A circle of magi worked intensively on his education, allowing him to take part in the most secret ceremonies, molding his soul, until at the age of 40, he finally had a revelation. He became the first person ever to be able to think about life on Earth in an entirely rational way. We saw in Chapter 8 how... Orpheus invented numbers, but in the age of Orpheus, it had been impossible to think of numbers without also thinking of their spiritual meaning. Now, because of Lucifer, it became possible to think of numbers without any symbolic connotations, to think of numbers purely as measures of quantity, unencumbered by any notions of quality. People were now free to measure, to calculate, and to make and build. We know from Plutarch that Orpheus's son, Asclepius, was equated with Imhotep, who lived in about 2500 BC, by then this great wave of change, this revolutionary way of thinking, had swept over from the Far East. Vizier to the Egyptian king, Dozier, Imhotep was known as the builder, the sculptor, the maker of stone bases. He was also called chief of the observers, which would become the title of the high priest of Helioposis. Sometimes represented as wearing a mantle covered in stars, and sometimes, too, represented holding a rolled scroll. Imhotep was famous in antiquity as both the great master builder and architect of the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara. In the 19th century, archaeologists excavating beneath the Steppe Pyramid discovered a store of secret treasures. Sealed there since the founding of the building that became known as the Impossible Things of Imhotep. Some of these are on display today in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. 19th century commentators were amazed above all by the vases which they suggested would be impossible for the craftsmen 
of the day to reproduce. Giraffe-necked and pot-bellied as they are, it's still difficult today to see how the rock crystal of these vases was hollowed out. Half an hour's drive north from Saqqara is the Great Pyramid. Arguably the most magnificent building ever, stands four square at this crossroads in history, oriented to the cardinal points with remarkable accuracy. The world does not need another description of its magnificence. Suffice to say, although it would in principle be possible to rebuild it today, this would be crippling for all but the world's richest economies. It would also stretch modern engineering to the limits of its abilities, particularly in the exactitude of its astronomical orientations. But what makes the Great Pyramid even more extraordinary, almost miraculous, according to the secret history, is the fact that it was the first Egyptian building. Wow, they got it right the first time. Conventional historians have assumed that the building ambition of the Egyptians progressed from simple one-story tombs called mastabas through the relative complexity of the step pyramid and culminated in the massive complexity and sophistication of the Great Pyramid. Conventionally dated to 2500 BC in the absence of contemporary textual accounts, and because these buildings contain no organic material that can be carbon dated, and because up till now there has been no method of date cutting stone, this has perhaps seemed an immensely commonsensical way of interpreting the evidence. I suggested at the beginning of this book that this is an upside down, other way around history, and in the secret doctrine, the Great Pyramid was built in 3500 BC, before the founding of the great civilizations of Egypt and Sumeria, at a time when the only previously existing constructions were the stone circles and other cyclopene monuments. We must imagine Stone Age peoples wearing animal skins and carrying primitive stone tools gazing at the Great Pyramid in stupefaction. According to the secret history, then the Step Pyramid and the other lesser pyramids represent not an ascent but a decline. The Great Pyramid has conventionally been seen as a tomb, as a variation on this theme, prompted by the narrow shaft which point from out of the so-called kings and queens chambers towards particular stars. I feel like the Great Pyramids were either to make electricity or they were a portal for consciousness, right? So you'd have the body, and then you would send the consciousness out the portal to the stars. Let me know what you guys think about that theory. It has been seen as a sort of machine mm, designed to aid the projection of the dead pharaoh's spirit out of this tomb towards its heavenly resting place. On this view, then the Great Pyramid is a sort of gigantic excarnation machine. From the point of view of the secret history, this interpretation is anachronistic. It was the universal belief at this time that all human spirits traveled up through the planetary spheres to the stars after death. In fact, as we have seen, the living still had such vivid experience of the spirit worlds that it would have been as hard for them to decide to disbelieve in the reality of the after-death journey as it would be hard for us to decide to disbelieve in the reality of the book or table in front of us. We should look elsewhere for an explanation of the function of the Great Pyramid. The whole tenor of ancient Egyptian civilization is that it was trying to get to grips with matter. We see this in its innovatory drive to cut and carve stone. We also see a new relation to matter in the practice of mummifying. We are never more ready to ascribe studied beliefs to the ancients than when we link mummification and elaborate grave goods to a supposed belief that the spirit might actually want to use these grave goods in the afterlife. The point of these burial practices, according to esoteric thought, is rather that they exerted a sort of magnetic attraction on the ascending spirit that would help it attain speedy reincarnation. It was believed that if the discarded body were preserved, it would remain a focus for the spirit that had left it, exerting an attraction that helped pull it down to earth again. The esoteric explanation of the Great Pyramid is similar. We saw in chapter seven, it's a portal back, that's cool, that the great gods, finding it increasingly difficult to incarnate, had retreated as far as the moon, visiting the earth increasingly rarely. The Great Pyramid is a gigantic incarnation machine. Egyptian civilization represents a great new impulse in human evolution, very different from the oriental civilization which had taught the matter in Maya 
or illusion. The Egyptians initiated the great spiritual mission of the West, sometimes called an alchemy, Sufism, Freemasonry, and elsewhere in the secret societies, the work. The mission was to work on matter, to cut it, carve it, to imbue it with sacred intention, until every particle of matter in the universe has been worked on and spiritualized. The Great Pyramid was the first manifestation of this urge. This history is about consciousness in different ways. First, this history has been told in various groups who have made it their aim to work themselves into altered states of consciousness. Second, this history supposes that consciousness has changed over time in a far more radical way than conventional historians allow. Third, it suggests that the mission of these groups is to lead the evolution of consciousness. In a mind-born universe, the end and aim of creation is always mind. I want to focus now on the second of these ways to show that some academics have recently written in support of the esoteric view, that consciousness used to be very different from what it is today. Contemporary with the rise of Egyptian civilization in about 3250 BC, Sumerian civilization arose in the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates. In the early cities of Sumeria, statues to ancestors and lesser gods stood in family homes. A skull was sometimes kept as a house that a minor spirit could inhabit. Meanwhile, the much greater spirit who protected the interests of the city was held to live in the God House, a building at the center of the temple complex. As the cities grew, so too did the God Houses, until they became ziggurats, great stepped pyramids built out of mud bricks. In the center of each ziggurat was a large chamber in which the statue of the God resided, inlaid with precious metals and jewels and wrapped in dazzling clothes. According to the cuneiform text, the Sumerian gods liked eating, drinking, music, and dancing. Food would be put on tables, then the gods left alone to enjoy it. After a time, the priests would come in and eat what was left. The gods also needed beds to sleep in and for enjoying sex with other gods. They had to be washed for this and dressed and anointed with perfumes. As with the grave gods in Egypt, the aim of these practices were to try to tempt gods to inhabit the material plane by reminding them of the sensual pleasures denied in the spirit worlds. The bee is a most important symbol in the secret tradition. Bees understand how to build their hives with a sort of pre-conscious genius. Beehives incorporate exceptionally difficult and precise data in their construction. For example, all hives have built into them the angle of the Earth's rotation. Sumerian seals show figures with human bodies, but bees' nests for heads. This is because, in this period, an individual's consciousness was experienced as made up of a collaboration of many different centers of consciousness. In the way we described in Chapter 2, these centers could be shared or even moved from one mind to another, like a swarm of bees from one hive to another. A brilliant analysis of Sumerian and other ancient texts by Princeton Professor of History Julian Jaynes was published in 1976. The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind argued that during this period humans had no concept of an interior life as we understand it today. They had no vocabulary for it, and their narratives show that features of mental life such as willing, thinking, and feeling which we experience as somehow generated inside us, they experienced as the activity of spirits or gods in and around their bodies. These impulses happened to them at the bidding of disembodied beings that lived independently of them, rather than arising inside themselves at their own bidding. It is interesting that the Jaynes analysis chimes with the esoteric account of the ancient history given by Rudolf Steiner. Born in Austria in 1861, Steiner represents a genuine stream of Rosicrucian thinking, and he is the esoteric teacher of modern times who has given the most detailed account of the evolution of consciousness. Jane's researches are, as far as I know, independent of this tradition. It is perhaps easier to appreciate Jane's analysis in relation to the more familiar Greek mythology. In the Iliad, for example, we never see anyone in any sense sit down and work out what to do, in the way we see ourselves doing. Jane's shows that for the people of Iliad, there's no such thing as introspection. When Agmemium robs Achilles of his mistress, Achilles does not decide to restrain himself. Rather, a god accosts him by the hair, warning him not to strike Agnemium. Another god rises out of the sea to console him, and it is a god who whispers to Helen of homesick longing. 
Modern scholars tend to interpret these passages as poetic descriptions of interior emotions. This is which the gods or symbols of the sort a modern poet might create. Jane's clear-sighted reading shows that this interpretation reads present-day consciousness back into texts written by people whose form of consciousness was very different. Neither is Jane's alone in his view. The Cambridge philosopher John Wisdom has written, The Greeks did not speak of the dangers of repressing instincts but they did think of thwarting Dionysus or of forgetting Poseidon for Athena. We shall see in the concluding chapters of this history how the ancient form of consciousness continued to thrive very much later than even Jane's posits. For the moment, though, I want to touch on a significant difference between Jane's analysis and the way the ancients themselves understood things. Jane's describes the gods who controlled the actions of the humans as being oral hallucinations, the kings of Samira and heroes of Greece are depicted by him as being, in effect, beset by a delusion. In the ancient view, by contrast, these were not, of course, mere delusions, but independent living beings. Jaynes believes that everyone in the Homeric era and the earlier lived in a world of delusion until, as he sees it, the right side of the brain gains primacy over the left. In Jane's view, then, each individual, although believing himself addressed by a god equally present to everyone else, was in fact trapped in a private delusion. The problem with this view is that, because hallucinations are almost by definition non-sensual, it would lead you to expect these people to live in a totally chaotic and barbaric state, characterized by complete mutual understanding. Modern clinical psychiatrists define a schizophrenic as someone who cannot distinguish between externally and internally generated images and sounds. Clinical madness causes extreme disabling distress together with impairment of domestic, social, and occupational functioning. Instead of the people of this era constructed the first post-flood civilizations with separation between priestly agricultural trading and manufacturing orders, organized labor forces engineered great public edifices, including canals, ditches, and of course temples. There were complex economies and large disciplined armies. In order for these people to have cooperated, surely the hallucinations would have had to be group hallucinations. If the ancient world view was a delusion, it had to have been a massive, almost infinitely complex and sophisticated delusion. What I have tried to present so far is a history of the world as it was understood by ancient people, who had a mind before matter worldview in which everyone collectively experienced gods, angels, and spirits as interacting with them. Thanks to Freud and Jung, we are all familiar with the idea that our minds contain psychological complexes which are independent of our centers of consciousness and so to some degree may be thought of as autonomous. Jung described these major psychological complexes in terms of the seven major planetary deities of mythology, calling them the seven major archetypes of the collective unconsciousness. Yet when Jung met Rudolf Steiner who believed in disembodied spirits, including the planetary gods, Jung dismissed Steiner as a schizophrenic. We shall see in chapter 27 how very late in life, shortly before he died, Young went beyond the pale as far as the modern scientific consensus goes. He concluded that these psychological complexes were autonomous in the sense of being independent of the human brain altogether. In this way, Young took one step further than Jane's by no longer seeing the gods as hallucinations as hallucinations, whether individual or collective, but as higher intelligence, he embraced the ancient mind before matter philosophy. The reader should be aware of taking the same step. It is important you be on your guard against any impression that perhaps, to be fair, this version of history hangs together in some way or that it feels true in some unspecific poetic or worse spiritual way. Important because a momentary lapse of concentration in this regard, and you might, without at first noticing it, and with a light heart and a spring in your step, begin to walk down the road that leads straight to the lunatic asylum. Gilgamesh, the great hero of Sumerian civilization, was king of Uruk in approximately 2100 BC. 
His story is full of madness, extreme emotion, anxiety, and alienation. The great poet Rainer Maria Rilke called it the epic of death dread. The story, as it has come down to us, has largely been pieced together from clay tablets excavated in the 19th century, but it seems nearly complete. At the start of his story, the young king is called the Budding Bull. He is bursting with energy, opening mountain passes, digging wells, exploring, going into battle. He is stronger than any other man, beautiful, courageous, a great lover from whom no virgin is safe, but lonely. He longs for a friend, someone who is his equal. So the gods created Enkidu. He was as strong as Gilgamesh, but was wild with matted hair all over his body. He lived among wild beasts. They ate as they did and drank from streams. One day, a hunter came face to face with this strange creature in the woods and reported back to Gilgamesh. When he heard the hunter's story, Gilgamesh knew in his heart that this was the friend he had been waiting for. He devised a brilliant plan. He instructed the most beautiful of the temple prostitutes to go naked into the woods to find the wild man and tame him. When she made love to him, he forgot, as Gilgamesh had known he would, about his home in the hills. Now, when Enkidu came across wild animals, they sensed the difference and no longer ran with him. They ran away from him. When Gilgamesh and Enkidu met in the marketplace at Uruk, there was a wrestling match of champions. The whole, popula- the whole population crowded around to watch. Gilgamesh finally won, finding Enkidu on his back while still keeping his own foot on the ground. So a famous friendship started a series of adventures. They hunted panthers and tracked down the monstrous Hawa Awa, who guarded the way through the cedar forest, when they later slew the Bull of Heaven. Gilgamesh had the horns mounted on the walls of his bedchamber. But the Enkidu fell dangerously sick. Gilgamesh sat by his bed six days and seven nights. Finally, a worm fell out of Enkidu's nose. At the end, Gilgamesh drew a veil across his old friend's face and roared like a lion that has lost her cubs. Later, he roamed the steppe, weeping fear of his own death beginning to gnaw at his entrails. Gilgamesh ended up at the tavern at the end of the world. He wanted to get out of his head. He asked the beautiful barmaid the way to Zyosudra, whom we have seen is another name for Noah or Dionysus. He was a demigod who had never really died. Gilgamesh made a boat with punting poles topped with bitumen such as are still used by Marsh Arabs to this day, and went to meet him. Zayasudra said, I will reveal to you a secret thing, a secret of the gods. There is at the bottom of the sea a plant that pricks like the rose. If you can bring it back up to the surface, you can become young again. It is the plant of eternal youth. Zayasudra was telling him how to dive beneath the seas that covered Atlantis, how to find the esoteric lore that had been lost at the time of the flood. Gilgamesh tied stones to his feet like the local pearl divers. He descended, plucked the plant, cut himself free of the stones, and rose to the surface in triumph. But while he was resting on the shore from his exertions, a snake smelled the plant and stole it. Gilgamesh was as good as dead. We still have a little ways to go, so you might want to find a snack. When we read the story of Gilgamesh, we may be intrigued to see how he fails the test that humanity's great leader has set him. There's a note of anxiety here that can be heard spreading ever more widely in the Babylonian and Mesopotamian civilizations that grew up to dominate this region. With the death of Gilgamesh, we are in the time of the greatest ziggurats, the story of the Tower of Babel, the attempt to build a tower up to heaven, the resulting loss of a single language uniting all humanity, represents the fact that as nations and tribes began to become attached to their own Hitlery spirits and guiding angels, they lost sight of the higher gods and above and beyond these higher gods, the great cosmic mind beyond that gives all the different parts of the universe one destiny. The ziggurats represent a misguided attempt to scale the heavens by material means. The Tower of Babel was built by Nimrod the Hunter, Genesis calls Nimrod the first potent on earth. The archaeologist David Roll has convincingly identified Nimrod as the historical Enmer Kar, Enmer the Hunter, the first king of Iraq who wrote to the neighboring king of Arada demanding tribute money. 
in what is believed to be the earliest surviving letter. Nimrod was the first man to seek power for its own sake. From this will to power came cruelty and decadence. In Hebrew tradition, a prophecy of the imminent birth of Abraham prompted Nimrod to mass infanticide. We should understand by this that he practiced infant sacrifice, burying the bodies in the fountains of his great buildings. We join Abraham in about 2000 BC, wandering in between the skyscrapers of his native Ur, Uruk. He decided to go on a quest to become a desert nomad to rediscover the sense of the divine that was in the process of being lost. When he visited Egypt, the pharaoh gave one of his daughters, Hagar, as a servant to Abraham's wife, Sarai. Hagar bore Abraham his first son. Ishmael, who is to become the father of the Arab nations, we should understand by this that Abraham learned great initiatic knowledge from the Egyptian priests. Marriages of this time were usually within a tribe or extended family. Supernatural powers were connected with blood and marriage between people of the same blood strength and powers, as taught in the tradition of the gypsies, for example. Marriage of individuals from different tribes could involve an exchange of powers and knowledge. What form of initiation might Abraham have received in Egypt? We should picture the candidate for initiation laid out in a granite tomb. He is surrounded by initiates who have sent him into a very deep sleep-like trance. When he is in the trance state, they are able to raise his vegetable body and with it his spirit or animal body up out of his physical body so that it hovers like a phantom over the mouth of the tomb. A witness of an initiation ceremony practiced on the Irish poet W.B. Yeats described how during the course of the ceremony a series of bells were rung to mark the stages. Yeats' spirit could be seen shining with different degrees of brightness during the different stages, each marked, too, by different patterns of color. Initiates who perform these sorts of ceremonies know how to mold the candidate's vegetable body so that when it sinks back into the material body, the candidate is able to use its organs of perception consciously. At the end of three days, the candidate will be born again or initiated, which is marked by the hierophant grasping him by the right hand and pulling him out of the coffin. In esoteric philosophy, the vegetable body is of utmost importance. Not only does it control vital bodily functions, but the chakras are, of course, the organs of the vegetable body. So this body, in effect, forms the portal between the physical world and the spiritual worlds. And if the chakras are enlivened, this may lead to powers of supernatural perception and influence, the ability to communicate with the disembodied spirits and also healing powers. In the temple sleep, which would still be practiced by initiates of the mystery schools, two and a half thousand years after Abraham, and is still practiced in some secret societies today, someone who was ill would be allowed to sleep in the temple. This sleep would last for three days, during which time the initiates would work on their vegetative bodies in a way not dissimilar to the process of initiation. Someone undergoing this process might have very realistic visions directed by the initiates. First, he would be plunged into utter blackness. He would seem to himself to be losing all consciousness, to be dying, but he would seem to himself to come round again, then be led by an animal-headed being, traveling down long passages and through a series of chambers. At different stages, he would be challenged and menaced by other animal-headed gods and demons, including monstrous crocodiles who would tear at him. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the candidate makes his way past these guardians of the thresholds by proclaiming, I am the Gnostic, I am the one who knows. The magical formula he uses in the process of initiation, he will be able to use again after death. He approaches the inner sanctum. He sees an extraordinary bright light shining through the cracks around the edge of the gates. He cries out, let me come, let me spiritualize myself, let me become pure spirit. I prepared myself for the writings of Thoth. Finally, out of the swirling waves of light, a vision emerges of the mother goddess suckling her child. This is a healing vision. Because it takes us back to the paradisiacal time we looked at in chapter 3 before the earth and the sun became separated, when the earth was illuminated from within by the sun god, a time before there was any 
dissatisfaction, disease, or death. And it looks forward to another time when earth and sun will be reunited, when the earth will again be transfigured by the sun. In all ages and in all places, there have been people who have believed that meditating on this image of the mother goddess and child brings about miracles of healing. After his stay in Egypt, Abraham moved westwards towards the region we know today as Palestine. He had to arm and train his servants to rescue his brother who had been captured by local bandits. Following a fierce and bloody fight, he was walking through a valley, which today's biblical scholars identify with the Kindron Valley, when he met a strange individual called Malachi Zedek. As with Enoch, there's just a brief mention of Malachi Zedek in the Bible, but an accompanying sense of the numinous and of something important left unsaid. Genesis 14, 18 through 20, and Malachi Zedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High, God possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into the hand. The sense of the numinous is reinforced by a mysterious passage in the New Testament. Hebrews 6.20-7.17 through Jesus was made and high priest for ever after the order of Malachi Zedek. For this Malachi Zedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom Abraham also gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Abedith, a priest continually, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever under the order of Malachi Zedek. Clearly something strange is going on. Clearly the mysterious individual who has the ability to live forever is no ordinary human being. In Kabbalistic tradition, Malachi Zedek's secret identity is Noah the great Atlantean leader who had taught humankind agriculture, the cultivation of corn and of the vine, who never really died but moved to another dimension. He now reappeared in order to be Abraham's spiritual teacher to initiate him to a higher level. In order to understand Malachi Zedek's initiate teaching, we must examine a later episode when, according to the ancient tradition, Malachi Zedek was present even though this is hidden in the biblical version. Isaac was 22 years old when his father took him up a mountain to sacrifice him on the altar of Melchizedek. It is very important in certain forms of initiation that at a particular point in the ceremony, the candidate believes, perhaps briefly but with total conviction, that he or she is going to die. He has perhaps understood that he is going to undergo a symbolic death, but it suddenly dawns upon him that there may have been a change of plan. Perhaps he has sworn the most solemn oaths on pain of death that he will mend his ways and live up to high ideals. Now with the blade held against him, he wonders if the initiates who have him in their power know that he has lied to them. He knows now, he comes to think about it, that he has done things he ought not to have done, not done the things he ought to have done, that there is no health in him. He knows in his heart of hearts he does not have enough willpower to keep the oaths he has sworn. He has just condemned himself to death out of his own mouth, and he is utterly unable to help himself. At this point, he realizes he needs supernatural help. We may catch a faint echo of these emotions of fear and pity if we are moved by a great tragedy. By Oedipus, Rex, or King Lear, an initiation, the candidate is made to feel the tragedy of his own life. In overwhelming need of catharsis, he begins to judge his own life as the demons and angels will judge it after death. As Abraham's knife began to slice open Isaac's throat, an angel substituted a ram whose horns had been caught in a nearby thicket. What the thorns in the thickest represent is the two-petaled or two-horned brow chakra, already entangled in matter. Abraham acts as he does because the mode of vision would have to be sacrificed. For the time being, at least, perception of the spirit worlds must be put to sleep. For the sake of the mission of the ancestors of Abraham to develop the brain as an organ of thinking. The Jews will be guided by Jehovah, the great spirit of the moon, the great God of thou shalt not, who helps humanity evolve away from animal and 
ecstatic experience, away from the life of tribal or group soul, towards the development of individual free will and free thinking. In the secret history, this sacrifice of the brow chakra takes place on the altar of Melchizedek, the great high priest of the sun mysteries. What this signifies is that Isaac was initiated to such a level that he understood the necessity for this next lunar stage of human development. The evolution of individual free will and free thinking will eventually enable humans to play a conscious part in the transforming of the world. Isaac stayed at Mystery School of Melchizedek for three and a half years learning of these teachings. Because Melchizedek is a priest of the sun mysteries, the school should be pictured as containing within its precedence a stone circle. Like Stonehenge. We have reached the great age of these sun temples, examples of which still survive in Lundberg in Germany, Karnak in France, and Stonehenge in England. In the 14th century BC, the historian Diodorus of Sicily described a spherical sun temple in the north dedicated to Apollo. Today, scholars believe he was describing Stonehenge, or more likely Callanish, in the far north of Scotland, but in either case, the association with Apollo should be understood as a looking forward to the rebirth of the sun god from the womb of the mother goddess. The other great contribution to the development of thought came, of course, from the Greek. The siege of Troy marks the beginning of the rise to greatness of Greek civilization when the Greeks seized the initiative from Chaldean Egyptian civilization and forged their own ideals. We have been tracing a history of the world in which, for the first time, the lives of great cultural heroes from around the world, Adam, Jupiter, Hercules, Osiris, Noah, Zarathustra, Krishna, and Gilgamesh, have been woven together into one chronological narrative. For the most part, they have left no physical traces, living on only in the collective imagination, preserved in scraps of story and scattered imagery. From now on, though, we will see that many legendary figures, presumed by most people to be entirely non-historical, have in fact been shown by recent archaeology to have left physical remains. The discovery of the runes of Troy by the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann in the 1870s has always been controversial. The archaeological layer he excavated properly dates to 3000 BC, and so is far too old to be Homer's, but today the majority of scholars agree that the layer relating to 1200 BC in the last Bronze Age is consistent with Homer's account. In the ancient world wars were fought for the possession of sacred initiatic knowledge, partly because of the supernatural powers this conferred. The Greeks laid siege, but they wanted to carry off the statue made by the hand of Athena called the Palladium. We should see their struggle to possess Helen in the same way. Today we may see in the face of a beauty the promise of happiness, to use Stenhall's phrase, yes we may cherish that promise in a cruder trivial sense, but we may also do so in a deeper and more significant sense. Great beauty can seem mystical to us, as if it holds the very secret of life. If I could be with that beautiful person, we think my life would be fulfilled. The presence of exceptional beauty can induce an altered state of consciousness, and male initiates have often been associated with very beautiful women, perhaps partly because their participation intensifies the secret sexual techniques of the schools. Possession of Helen would enable the Greeks to move forward to the next stage of civilization. We see the changed consciousness that the story of the siege of Troy is all about in the famous saying of Achilles, better to be a slave in the land of the living than the king of the shades. The heroes of Greece and Troy loved to live in the sun, and it was a terrible thing when it was suddenly shut out, and their spirits were sent off to the lands of the shades, the western gloom. This was the death dread of Gilgamesh intensified to a level that seems almost modern. Note that Achilles was not doubting the reality of life after death, but his conception of it evidently did not go beyond the dreary half-life of the sublunar sphere. A vision of the heavenly spheres above had been lost to him. We can see this turning point in 
consciousness from another angle if we ask ourselves who out of the heroes really won the siege of Troy for the Greeks. It was not the brave strong hero Achilles, the almost invincible last of the demigods. It was Odysseus of the nimble wit who defeated the Trojans by tricking them into accepting the gift of a wooden horse which had soldiers inside it. To today's sensibility, the story of the Trojan horse seems almost completely implausible. From the point of view of modern psychology, it just seems unrealistic to suppose that anyone could be so gullible. But at the time of the Trojan War, people were only just beginning to emerge from the collective mind into which we try to imagine ourselves earlier, moving through the ancient wood and have just seen Jane's try to define. Before the Trojan War, everyone shared the same world of thoughts. Others could see what you were thinking. No lie would have been possible. People interacted with a terrible sincerity. They had a sense that we have lost that in everything they did they were taking part in cosmic events the date of the sage of troy is also the date of the first trick in history have you guys ever seen the movie the invention of lying it's pretty fucking good anyway that's the end of chapter 11 so next time we read the secret history of the world we will be on chapter 12 which is the descent into darkness moses and the kabbalah aken aten and satan solomon shiba and hiram king arthur and the crown chakra this book kills me it's like an entire tongue twister but i really love it also so it's all right if you are going to bed, I hope you have sweet dreams. If you did not subscribe already, please do that. If you enjoyed this chapter, smash the thumbs up button. And also, don't forget to ring the notification bell so you always get notified when I upload. Thank you so much, my lovely lunatics. Until next time, goodbye!